even at that time, everybody, every territory, everybody was jumping ship and going to WWF. And you know, to this day, I get mad when people say that Vince McMahon killed the territories. And when he didn't, and what's so amazing about that is, yeah, Vince offered all these promoters a deal. They didn't have to take it. Nobody ever talks about that. You get up there and all of a sudden there's 15 transfer trucks with their logo on the side. All of their employees, the ring crew had these uh, jumpsuits with matching logos and all that. You know, we're not in Kansas no more, Dorothy, I'm telling you. And we actually went into the building, uh, Chicago up there, to we actually went in and got kind of lost. First person I ran into was Vince McMahon. For, of all the million employees, we ran into him and the most impressive thing to me to this day, he knew my whole name. Wow. People wonder why he's on top of his game right now. He knew, I took three guys with me, Tommy Angel, David Isaacs, and some of Nelson Royals guys. He knew every one of us. He knew our name, he thanked us for coming. If there's anything he can do. For a young kid like me, from backwoods of North Carolina, it's the greatest moment of my life, that he even knew, because I've always heard over the years that you don't have to go up there and do a dark match. If Vince McMahon wants you, he's already heard about you. Chances are he's already seen you. You know, it don't matter where it's at. I never knew what a tryout was. I never heard of a tryout. I thought they they want you or they don't. And one day, uh, J.J. Dillon called me and said, hey, Vince would like to get in, get you, want you to come in and get a look at you. This was in 94, 95, I think it was. And I go, what do you mean get a look at me? He goes, yeah, come on in for a tryout. Or a tryout, what's a tryout? He goes to see if uh, we want to use you. And I said, well, does it pay? And he goes, yeah, it pays 300 bucks a shot. I said, well, I'll come in for the money and see if I'll try you guys out. I'll see if I like you guys. So I came in and did the money, and uh, they offered me a job, and I said I couldn't take it because I was already with ECW. And Vince goes, like, I can't believe that you would give up a job. I'm, 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 some, I'm offering you 200, $250,000 a year, and you're going to give up a job for a job that might not even be there tomorrow. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know. Got screwed in the end, but whatever. What was it that made you want to stay with ECW instead of the WWE? That Paul made these big old promises, and I, and I liked uh, being able to express my art form my way. WWE would have changed me, and uh, and actually what they had in mind, I don't know if you remember, was called the Sultan. The Sultan was one of the Samoans, and he had his tongue cut out, supposedly, and he had a thing over his mouth. And his uncle, his manager was his uncle, the Iron Sheik. So it was kind of like my gimmick. I didn't speak, and uh, my uncle was, iron, was the Sheik, you know, and I wasn't a sultan, but he had the baggy pants. He kind of made, made him look like me, and he didn't talk, you know. That was the, the, that was the idea they wanted for me, because they go, we, we would modify your gimmick. And I go, well, well I don't want to change nothing. You know, I'm happy it's the way I am. And, uh, and then Vince goes, well, no, we have, we'd have to, we don't hire talent, we create talent. And that's what I understood that, you know, they, they weren't hiring me for Sabu, they were hiring me for a body, you know. So they kept that and then basically just placed it on Rikishi. Put out somebody else. Yeah, Rikishi, exactly, you remember, yeah. yeah. I don't know why I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They only wanted you in under their terms so yeah. that they could kind of mold you into their right. own. Right, and then someone could say, well, I take credit for him going over or, or blame it on him because he didn't go over, you know what I mean? But since I, I was, I kind of built myself, no one could take credit for me. The only thing they could do is say, uh, he did it wrong because I didn't show him. You know, or something like that. You know, but I, I didn't want to uh, embarrass my uncle by saying the Iron Sheik was my uncle. That's that was a deal breaker. I probably would have did it if the Iron Sheik wasn't involved. Nothing against him personally, and he even knows that. But there's no way, you know, it'd break my uncle's heart to say that this guy was my uncle or or the the you know to go with that stupid gimmick. You know. Had you met Owen before? Nope. How did that turn out? It was a great match. But um, I wrestled um, uh, Scotty too hotty uh, in my first match and Vince liked it so he goes this is my mark match I want you to wrestle Owen Hart but be careful he's got a bad knee boom 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 so I went out there and I wrestled him and Vince said great you got a job after that match he said I had a job and that's when he offered me an up boom 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 then uh, I had another night to wrestle and then 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 that night I said no I'm, I can't take the job do you look back and say you know what man this thing with Paul Heyman I mean yeah I wish I would have took it <laughs> I wish I would have took it yeah yeah I came when Vince called Vince told me, I'm going to call you in about six months, and then you're going to come and work for me forever. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I went back and worked for Vern for about six months, but I knew the call was coming. Right. You know what? You know what, why, how, how Vince did it with me? He waited until he had booked Minnesota, and then he had me jump one for that card. Right. I left the AWA and went to the WWF in that card. Did you give Vern notice through a, a mail and then you did promo? Telegram. Telegram? And that was under Vince's orders. I was going to go do it face-to-face, -face and Vince said, I don't want you to do that. 
because he said all that'll be is a confrontation and a fight. He said, just send them a telegraph stating that you no longer desire the bookings of the AWA, that you are now with the WWF. He was my boss, so I did what my boss told me to do. Oh, I loved Vince Jr. Vince Jr. was a savior in a way to all of us in the business. He had a vision and, 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 and the fact is production and we ended up on NBC television and uh, we all became megastars. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today hmm. without what happened at that point. But I played a role in it too. Without a doubt. You know, uh, you know but we all, but, but we had threats. We had death threats. All of us were told we'd never work in another territory. We'd be blackballed again. But that didn't bother me because I was ready to end it anyway when I was done with him, which I did. We were completely on until I brought my lawsuit against Vince when I left him. About the royalties and all that? Yeah. Okay. And when I sued Vince, of course, we had to depose him. Well, let me regress a little. Right before WrestleMania two, and right before I did Predator, right. I stood up in the dressing room and tried to unionize wrestling. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. And, I, and there were nobody from the office there when I did it. I said, boys, now's our chance. All the publicity's gone out on WrestleMania 2. All we have to do is refuse to wrestle and go public and say we want federal, because it's federal law. We want union representation to come in. And what caused that, I was in Vegas. And I got on an elevator with Gene Upshaw. Remember, head of the NFL right. union? Right. I remember Big Gene looked at me and all he said to me was, you boys need to unionize. Hmm. And I said, I know, Gene. And so I made this spiel to the boys. I said, look, if we can do it, then we can get, sh we can get WCW to follow suit. If WCW's wrestlers will do what we're doing here, we can have a union. I made the big spiel. The next day, my phone rang. It was Vince. He came with an eyelash of firing me. I was going to ask you, how much heat did you get for that? Oh, huh. the only thing that saved me, and the reason I did it, I, was, I had to quit Vince to do Predator. Vince wasn't going to let me do it. That's one of my questions. And I quit. I told him, well, then I quit. Because I said, I can always come back to wrestling. I'll never get a chance to co-star with Arnold Schwarzenegger again. As I went off 10 weeks to do Predator, Saturday night main event got renewed for a second season. But NBC thought there'd be Jesse Ventura. There wasn't Jesse Ventura. It was Bobby Heenan. Right. The heat came down from NBC. We bought this program with Jesse Ventura. Where the hell is he? Then Vince came back, and now the ball was in my court. Hmm. And so uh, when I came back from Predator, the first thing I did on the set of Predator, Schwarzenegger came up to me and said, Jesse, my next film this fall is going to be The Running Man. He said, there's a part in there you're perfect for. I wish I would like you to do it. I said, great. So before, when I got back to the United States after Predator, before I even talked to Vince, I signed The Running Man that fall so I would have the ace in the hole. This way I could say to Vince, no. Right. Because That's I now had an acting career. And plus, when I did Predator, I got my, when I came back to Vince then, I said, Vince, you won't hear me bring up Union anymore. He goes, really, why not? I said, because I'm now a member of SAG. I got my union. I've got retirement. I've got medical benefits. I said, if these guys are too stupid to want it, I said, then let them deal with it. I got my union. Now, when you came back, did you sense uh, a little bit of a strain on your relationship with Vince to work with? No. Maybe, you know? No. Nope. Okay. Vince is always a professional. When all you're business? On, all business when you're on the mic and performing. Okay. Or doing what you do. No, I give him credit for that. Plus, you're an asset to his company, so... Yeah, know. there was no hostility whatsoever. Vince yeah. McMahon flew me in, me and my wife, limousine, whole nine yards into Newark. Stanford, is I'm, I'm saying that right? Yeah, Stanford, Connecticut. Stanford, yep. Connecticut flew me in the whole thing and uh, and this is before I think even he knew he was buying the company fast forward buys the company I become what's your name again instead of I said wait a minute we just met don't you remember us meeting and talking and and that was all gone then because now he owns the company I've got no right I got no stroke I got no leverage they offer me I think 175. And I said, Vince, I said, I have to sell everything. I, you know, it's a lot of money and thank you. I said, but I have to sell everything in, in, in the world. I sell my house. I have to sell my motorcycle, my cars. I said, give me, I cannot give me, I cannot do a little better than that. I mean, keep in mind, no leverage. I think we ended up selling, settling at 225 or 250, you know, with uh, some incentives. 
I came up with a brilliant idea, I thought. I said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to Vince and say, look, let's get past all this money stuff. Let's, let's do this. To get to the figure out, back to the 250, I said, let's, let's just, you ain't gotta pay me for the last two months. And that would have been about like 60 grand for me, 60, 80 grand for two months. And he said, um, uh, I said, this is, forget, don't be, I won't sit at home. I'll come to work right away. And my agent was Brad Small at the time. He went, Mark, great idea, great idea. So that got the heat off me, we thought. Um, I say Vince $80,000. I come aboard with the contract he wanted. Because 225, when you're 31 and you're Buff Bagwell, you're still going to be a millionaire because I'm such a baby still. Yep. I'm in the prime of all of it. So let's suck hind tit for 250 over here, a ton of money still, knowing you're going to be in the half million dollar range in a few years and be one of their main players. You're in shape, you're healthy, you feel good. Let's get over as team, as friends. So I did so and was fired in two weeks. <laughs> so it was pretty rough. You had to reinvent yourself in the character, but keep that gray area because that's what Vince loved. Vince wanted me. Did he like a, your character? Did he get it? I, I I would I don't I I wouldn't be remiss to say that I think I was probably his favorite character he had on that show for about a year. I don't. Maybe he hated me. Maybe he thought it was the funniest thing. I don't know, but I was booked more than any other guy with the microphone on TV for a year and a rookie year. Me and Big Cass. We're the number one merchandise sellers in the company, and that is what Vince likes. <sighs> Money. So if Vince loves John Cena, why does he love John Cena? Because he's the top guy in the company. He makes money. He shows up to work every day, does his job to the best of his ability. Nobody can ever say that Enzo didn't show up to work and get his fucking ass kicked, hop up, and do it again the next night. You know? It was, it, it, I was bringing... He, when I talked to Vince... The first time I ever talked to him, I brought him this book. Right. I said, for the past four years you've been investing in me, I want you to know that I haven't taken that lightly and because I'm on salary in NXT, I've deemed that to be on the clock all day, every day. And because of it, I've written about 4,000 pages worth of material here. And everything that I've ever said on your television program, I've highlighted. I make music. And this happened after I got knocked out cold on the pay-per-view. This right. is when I went to Vince. I said, I make music. And if I can never wrestle again, I want you to know that this is what I've been doing. And then I just shook his hand and I left. Every time me and Cass ever saw, you know, Vince, dude, I didn't want to do it. Everybody says have a relationship with Vince. Talk to Vince. But like, dude, I was like, bro, don't ask, don't tell, bro. Like, if we see that guy, can't shake his hand, get the fuck back in the locker room, you know, go hide in the hallway, dude, whatever, you know, go fucking, you know, avoid this guy at all costs. But every time we saw him, he smiled and shook our hands and was just like, ah. And then maybe he'd like, hit me with a punch or something. I'd sell it or <laughs> hit a foot shuffle, dude. I don't fucking know. You know, when I saw him, I was always in character. Every time I saw him, I was in character. I never left character right so he couldn't really he didn't know the person he never knew the person i didn't want i knew that i was hunter's redhead stepchild and hunter will sit in a room browbeat me and tell me i'm about to be fired and then the next night i get handed a microphone in the main event on fucking monday night raw it's like vince vince is the one calling the shots now buddy for some of the newer fans that are out there that may not be familiar with your work and with the WWE Network and things like that out now, what would you recommend fans check out of Buddy Landell? Well, there's Flair and I, Shawn Michaels and I, uh, there's uh, some matches on the WWE's website. But you can go on YouTube and find all of my stuff. I mean, you know, I've wrestled, uh, you know. If you don't know who Buddy Landell is, what's up with that? Hey, what up? What up, Buddy? I love it. Uh, they're all over YouTube and everywhere else. I mean, you know, I don't, you know. Vince is selling everything that I've ever done, and I, of course, I'll never see a nickel out of it. Talking about pimps in the pulpit. Shane, can I get an amen from Amen Corner? If you can't say amen, say out. I've signed one contract in my life, Bill Watts in 1986 with UWF, right? 
but everything from 81 until today, somehow Vince bought it and gets exclusive rights over my, you know, uh, copyright of my name and likeness and, and uh, you know, all of these things that, I love Vince, you know, but I just feel like that, you know, hey, if you're going to sell it, pay me. I mean, you know, but that's just me. We actually went to Vince's house. It was Hawk and I and Ellery went to Vince's house, and uh, we were just negotiating with Jim Crockett with a guaranteed contract. So nobody had guaranteed contracts at the time, so we were going to be the first ones, besides Flair, that had a guaranteed contract with the NWA. So we go to Vince's mansion out there in, uh, I think it's in Stamford, Connecticut. Yeah. And uh, we go to the office. We went to the house first. Sat there, and it was kind of funny in a way because... Vince got up to leave the meeting at one time, but he left all Piper's and Hogan's merchandising numbers. They're sitting right on there in the printout. <laughs> like, we're not going to look, right? He goes, yeah, you got merchandise stuff here. Here's numbers right here. Of course, we looked. Baiting the hook. So we saw that, and we went to Vince and listen, Vince, here's our guarantee contract. Can you match that? We're going to do guarantee. And he says, well, at the time, we don't do guarantee contracts. We give you opportunity." I said, well, I can't pay bills on opportunity. Right. So if you have a guaranteed contract, we would do it. Otherwise, we're probably just going to stay with the AWA. And that's what we did. But going in Vince's house, I mean, it was actually kind of an interesting thing. I mean, above his fireplace mantle is this, like, big, like, five-foot by eight-foot painting of Vince in one of those green, total green suits and everything like that. And, of course, I, Hawk and I were jabbing with him a little bit about the painting on the wall and... You know, we actually had a great meeting with him. You know, he had a chi like an Oriental chef that made us some really like, like authentic like chicken fried rice and all that kind of stuff. It was actually really good. We had a nice meeting, and then we went to the office, looked around the office, but then we decided to stay with the NWA. He played it off like he didn't care, but I think he really did care. We were, only one, we were the only one that didn't jump. He knew what we were making and what we needed to make and what we deserved to make by the time we came in there as a team. And he pulled the old, oh, well, you're a team, so I can't pay you what, like, a single guy would be paying. i got to split it up because there's two of you. And I was thinking to myself, that's crap because we're selling <laughs> a lot of merchandise. Right. You're selling hundreds of millions of dollars of merchandise of us. Come on, you know. So he says, okay. I said, well, as long as you make what we were making when we were singles, and in the first year, we made hundred grand less hmm. than what he shook hands on. We said, hey, man, you said we were going to make this. I'll make it up to you the second year. It was a hundred grand less again, so now we're short about two hundred grand each, working for Vince. Right. So that's where Hawks start getting really pissy and saying, you know, screw Vince. If I want to go party and I want to go drink, I'm going to go party and drink. This gr I'm a grown ass man. He goes, Vince is screwing us on pay. I'm going to go do this. Were people in the office trying to turn the screws on Hawk and keep him on the straight and narrow? Well, I was trying to because he's my partner, man. Right. I was trying to keep him on a straight and narrow, you know, but. But yeah, they, they tested him a lot and they came and told him he pissed dirty a couple of times, which we both, we both knew he wasn't dirty. Right. And Hawk said, test me again. I'll tell you right now, I'm not dirty. I can promise you I'm not dirty. Hmm. And, you know, but then again, but Hawk was bucking the system, you know. He, and I try to tell Hawk, listen, man, you work for 3M or Honeywell or any of those companies, you got rules and regulations you got to abide by. But Hawk just didn't want to do it. He goes, man, this guy's screwing us on pay animal. I'm sick of this crap. And then finally, when the straw broke the camel's back was in SummerSlam 92. And, you know, at Wembley Stadium, Hawk flipped out. I wanted to go back a little bit to when you were in the WWF and um, when you were writing for them, because I guess right. a lot of people don't know this. But um, I wanted to get your takes on what you thought of some of the gimmicks at the time and what you thought some of the best and the worst were. I wasn't actually writing for him. I was uh, producing. There's a big difference. Um, the writers were uh, Pat and Bruce and Jerry, I guess. And uh, I was being groomed to be a writer, and I, uh, I would put the second-run shows together, like All-American and Mania. Um, and because uh, I think they had already phased out super... No, they, maybe they hadn't phased out superstars yet. Now they're bringing it back, but they... Um, but, uh, maybe they still had superstars, so maybe I was formatting that too. But um, anyway, I was formatting All-American and Mania and uh, also producing, co associate producing Raw. But I didn't actually write the shows yet. Um, and... Uh, but if I would have been writing, if I would have ran to Zoo, I certainly wouldn't have put a guy who's a hell of a talent like Wild Bill Irwin in a uh, hockey outfit. 
with hockey uh, goon. boots. Yeah, ridiculous. The guy was a hell of a talent. I mean, awesome talent, you know. But they, they ruined, they took a lot of guys who were really talented um, uh, territory guys and uh, just abused them, you know. What are some it, examples of that that you can remember? I just gave you one. Besides that, I know you had mentioned Steve Kern as Skinner Steve before. Steve Kern as Skinner, yeah. Um, who else? Um, Rip Oliver, uh, they, did, they did a number on him. They, uh, Rip Oliver basically ruled the Pacific Northwest for like 10 years. You know, him, uh, Buddy Rose, um, well, actually, I got to think about my history because I wasn't there, you know what I mean, at the, during the glory years. Um, uh, let's see. I was there for like, the, you know, like I helped, you know, I was instrumental, I think, in part of it being like the last big run of Portland wrestling before it went, you know, in the tank. But um, at least that's what Sandy Barr said, who was the other promoter besides Don Owens. Um, and I didn't have to pay him too much to say that. Um, but uh, so let me think. So it was Buddy Rose and Rip the Crippler Oliver. And uh, and that was pretty much, I mean, it was a hot territory. I mean, the trips were short. You know, the average trip was what, 50 to 70 miles one way? <laughs> I mean, it's great. You worked six nights a week, sometimes seven. Um, the, longest, the longest trip was 200 miles, and, and, oh, and we bitched a fit about it. Um, and that was only like once every six to eight weeks. Um, the, um, the arena, basically the territory, I think I talked about this, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyway, but so Rip the Crippler Oliver, um, see, this is what happens when you do it later, you know, a couple weeks later, you forget what you said. Um, or a couple hours later, for God's sakes. Um, but Rip Oliver was like the kingpin there. And when the WWE came through in 84 and uh, took all the top town out of each territory, um, they took it out and, they, uh, and basically they wanted to bankrupt the territories of the top stars. And they brought Rip Oliver in, made him the super ninja. Why? For one night on some pay-per-view, I think against the Ultimate Warrior or some Saturday night main event. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then basically, once Rip had given up the job as Booker in Portland, then my buddy, the Grappler, he wasn't my buddy then, but he became my buddy, the Grappler took over. He actually gave it to his buddy, the Grappler, uh, and recommended him. And the Grappler came in, and the Grappler had a great long run there. But unfortunately for Rip, you know, Rip, unfortunately, you know, got ousted himself, you know, because he thought he was going to get a job in New York, you know what I mean? And it's kind of bullshit. I mean, it's total bullshit. I mean, even bigger case of that is Baron Von Raschke was you know, a legend, you know, is this, uh, and they brought him in, took away his German accent, made him look like the emperor in Star Wars, um, sort of, I mean, with the hood, he looked like, maybe that was how I perceived he looked like, but, yeah. but even so, I mean, it doesn't matter, I mean, the fact is, is they didn't use him worth a crap, and basically they just took him to, to help crush the AWA, which, you know, it's, I, I don't know, that's kind of, it's very predatory, especially considering how much he cried, Vince cried about that Turner was being predatory to him, you know, it's like, you know, and then like, you know, Vern was predatory to other territories and he complained about them being, New York being predatory to him. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, hey, look, I'm not a fan of predatory tactics, um, but, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, you know, I mean, I, I think it's bullshit, the whole, you know, the whole, you know, raping, uh, you know, raping and pillaging the other territories, knowing full well you're not going to use them just so you can, um, you know, put them out of business, you know what I mean, with promises of this and that that never occur. Um, and uh, it's bullshit, but <laughs> it's even more bullshit when then you do it to somebody and then you cry when somebody, like a little bitch, when, when somebody does it back to you, you know. Who, who's some other people that, uh, that they abused? Uh, Terry Taylor was a big star, you know what I mean? Uh, UWF, you know, it was, um, and they made him into the Red Rooster, and the first run was with the Brooklyn Brawler that he did the job for things, so, you know, that's not going anywhere. Did you have any reluctance going up there? Were you weary of how maybe some of the other guys from like NWA were used or portrayed? Did you ever, did, or did you know going in, this is how it's going to be? I, well, see, I went up there thinking I was going to be pushed. The only, man, I, I don't want, the only reason that Vince McMahon, and I worked up there another uh, 13 months, and made and made um, I was made top pay. I was making top pay, but I never went higher than maybe fifth or sixth on the card. Okay, because fifth or sixth was the lull of the card. In other words, they would get 
the fans would be getting bored by this time, okay? And they got another four or five matches to go, maybe six or seven more matches to go. And so Jack Black Jack Lonza went and told McMahon that he wanted me on ever on all his cards, put Bart on there, but put me on sixth or seventh match. And that way, I because I I could activate a crowd, and uh, he did not want me. He did not want me getting over, and I was. He did. He would not let me cut an interview because he knew if he let me, I cut one interview for one the WrestleMania of that year, whatever year that I think it was in '90. The WrestleMania, I cut one interview, and it was an interview for if anybody on the card didn't want to do the job. I was to step in and do the job, and I would be on whatever part of WrestleMania that was supposed to be. The uh, the uh, the dude the the I cut a little. I cut an interview. It's the only one I ever cut up there. And uh, the uh, the announcer dude was with us out in the Carolinas. He said, "Bart, you're one of the best interviewers in the business." I said, "Brother, he won't not let me cut no interviews." He said, "Why?" I said, "I don't know, but I'm gonna find out." And eventually I did. I was brought up there to be showed that how much money I could have made if I'd have come up there when he wanted me, when Bass lost that hair match, okay? He wanted my wife, but Sergio Puckett against Beefcakes and Blackjack Mulligan and uh, put the world strap on us and all the way. But no, Bart stayed his butt in the Carolinas. <laughs> that didn't last very much longer after that, what, 10, I think maybe 12 years, 15 years, something like that. I don't know. But uh, it was, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, the, 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 I, I done nothing but jobs for 13 months, like I said, except for that one match. Everything yeah. else, everything else, and unless, every now, I'll take that back here because every now and then I'd be in a tag situation. Mm -hmm. They would give me, the, the, the guys would go and say, listen, Bart, Get boom, 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 and you scoot, and then we'll beat you. We'll beat this guy. Yeah. And that's that's that was the highlight of my uh, of my span up there. Uh, the uh, the the it, it it was like when I got my notice. It was it was it was it was a relief off of me. It was a relief off of me, and uh, uh, not only did I cry, my wife cried, not because that she was sorry that I wouldn't be bringing that money home. She was crying the same reason because of the pressure was gone. It was, it was a big, it was a relief.